we've witnessed the test flights of all the Starship prototypes up to SN15. Until now, they've all aimed to land on solid ground, which is the standard procedure. However, SpaceX is poised to diverge from this norm with the SN20. They've chosen a rather unconventional approach, splashing it down in the water. This prompts the question, why? Why opt for such an unconventional landing method with the SN20? And crucially, will it ensure a safe landing, especially if the Starship is crewed? These are questions we're eager to explore. But before we delve deeper, consider subscribing to the channel. The flight plan for the SN20 prototype has been unveiled. As per its blueprint, the Starship SN20 will embark on a 90-minute journey, orbiting the Earth once before executing a controlled descent into the Pacific Ocean near Hawaii. While awaiting verification and approval from the U.S. Federal Aviation Agency, it's evident that considerable thought went into this decision. The notion of a spacecraft ditching into water rather than aiming for a conventional ground landing as envisioned by SpaceX may seem peculiar. However, it's rooted in careful deliberation. You may remember the infamous test of the Starship SN8 prototype, which was the first prototype cleared to perform a high-altitude flight test. It ascended as planned and also descended similarly, though the horizontal fall designed to break speed. Right afterwards, though, the rocket failed to whip itself upright the way it was supposed to. An inadequate deceleration caused by incorrect pressure values resulted in a crash. The crash caused a major explosion on the landing pad and the total destruction of the prototype. Since SN8, SN9, SN10, and SN11 all exploded at various points of the flight plans for various reasons, highlighting the significant challenges SpaceX has faced in perfecting the Starship design. The testing of the SN15 prototype was judged to be a resounding success, but it still was not free of trouble, as a short fire broke out after landing successfully. This was despite the prototype boasting significant improvements over its predecessors, including new avionics systems, a new plumbing system, and an improved design of the Raptor rocket engine. Clearly, SpaceX has been experiencing numerous road bumps on the way to building a spaceship fully capable of reaching orbit and then safely landing back down. Even more important is the fact that similar problems keep appearing through subsequent prototypes, underscoring the complexity of the challenges involved in space travel and the necessity for continuous improvement and innovation. These problems cannot be ignored if the Starship is ever going to become a viable option for long-distance space travel. It's important to note that SpaceX is venturing into uncharted territory within the aerospace industry with the Starship. Prior to this, no rocket design had ever been conceived to be reused after spaceflight, as it was considered technically infeasible. With limited precedent to draw from, SpaceX's engineers and scientists are essentially learning as they go, constantly adjusting their approach in the development of this groundbreaking technology. Rocket science is notoriously challenging, and SpaceX acknowledges that failures and setbacks are inherent to their design and prototyping philosophy. They adhere to the principle of rapid prototyping, aiming to construct affordable yet mass-producible prototypes. This approach allows them to avoid wasting crucial time and resources by swiftly implementing corrections based on rapid testing and feedback. Consequently, the regulatory requirements imposed by the FAA and FCC are more stringent, given the heightened risks associated with constant prototyping and potential damage. Elon Musk's commitment to operating in this manner is evident in SpaceX's choice of the relatively exclusive and isolated Boca Chica location. As a private company, liability is a significant concern. Any harm caused by their rocket launches or debris could lead to legal repercussions and even the possibility of the company being disbanded. Therefore, SpaceX is driven to take every necessary measure to mitigate risks and ensure safety in their operations. The decision to land the SN20 in the water has a straightforward technical rationale. 
analysis of SpaceX's flight plan submitted to the FCC indicates that the SN20 will re-enter Earth's atmosphere from orbit at an angle. Unlike previous prototypes, which attempted vertical landings, the SN20 will employ a different approach, potentially splashing down into the water. This deviation aims to identify any underlying issues that caused problems during previous landings, particularly during the phase where the rocket adjusts its orientation to reduce speed before returning vertically. However, this plan presents its own challenge. The rocket's re-entry at high orbital speeds could pose risks to lives and property if attempted over land. Despite space's confidence in the SN20's newer technology, the worst-case scenario could involve the total disintegration of the starship upon re-entry. With debris falling harmlessly into the ocean, SpaceX's decision is informed by past disasters, notably the 2003 Space Shuttle Columbia tragedy. The Columbia re-entered Earth's atmosphere at orbital speed, but a faulty thermal protection system damaged during takeoff led to the spacecraft's disintegration and the loss of all crew members. SpaceX has implemented a new thermal protection system on the SN20 to mitigate such risks, especially given the rapid construction of the prototype. Furthermore, landing the ship intact in the water offers valuable data for engineers and scientists, facilitating the development of future prototypes. This approach aligns with SpaceX's goal of achieving safe landings onto launch pads, ultimately advancing their spacecraft design. We should also consider the strategies for recovering or not recovering the Super Heavy booster responsible for launching SN20 into orbit. SpaceX has clearly expressed their intention to make the Super Heavy booster reusable, as evidenced by their detailed 3D animation illustrating the process. To achieve this goal, SpaceX has repurposed decommissioned oil fields in the Gulf of Mexico into seaborne landing platforms for the boosters, in addition to utilizing drone ships for the same purpose. Although it hasn't been explicitly confirmed yet, there is a strong possibility that the Super Heavy booster prototype carrying SN20 will attempt to safely land on one of these seaborne platforms. Successfully recovering an intact booster will greatly assist SpaceX in rapidly advancing the development of the Starship, moving beyond the prototype phase. In summary, SpaceX has opted to land the Starship in the water due to their assessments, highlighting significant challenges in the landing phase. Their aim is to minimize the risk of damage to others. With the landing process still undergoing refinement, utilizing a recovery procedure known to be mostly safe allows for the identification of further issues without sacrificing a spaceship to destruction. Moreover, the increased feasibility of the Super Heavy booster's safe descent motivates SpaceX to target a dual success with both the booster and the Starship in subsequent launches. If successful, SpaceX will achieve crucial spacecraft flight tests in rapid succession, marking a significant milestone in their quest to transform science fiction into reality. While SpaceX's endeavors are rife with challenges, their past results and Elon Musk's leadership inspire confidence in their ability to overcome obstacles and pave the way for human space travel. Given the enormity of their task, your thoughts on whether the SN20's water landing makes sense, or if SpaceX should explore alternative methods would be valuable. Thanks for watching.